Hello, Dragon Con goes virtual. We are here for the Nature is Still Kinkier Than You panel, and I would like to introduce my panelists. Tina? Hi, I'm Tina Say. I'm the senior writer at Science News Magazine. I used to be a geneticist, but then I became a journalist. And so what can I say? I'm, I'm here to talk about some wild animal sex. Welcome. Emily? Other Emily? <laughs> Hi, I'm Emily Willingham. I am a science writer. I have most lately been writing most often um, for Scientific American. I also am a book author. I have a I have an English degree, which turns out you might need more. So I also have a PhD in gonads and a postdoc in penises, which is I think why I'm here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Welcome. So let's just start right to it. The first section, you want to put that where? And I believe Tina would like to talk about anglerfish and their reproductive methods. Well, anglerfish get really into each other. And I mean, I'm talking really into each other such that they actually fuse together when they, when they mate. It's, it's, and it's not just uh, genital parts, it's skin, it's they're sharing blood. And when you think about it, how in the world can you even do that? Because you have an immune system, right? And the immune system is set up to reject other organisms, parts that might come into you on a permanent basis anyway. and. <laughs> So what the anglerfish has done is they've just said, eh, we don't need this whole immune system thing. And they've jettisoned a bunch of genes that are involved in making antibodies, for instance. And there's two species of anglerfish that may not make any antibodies at all, which is really bad because antibodies help fight off infections. Um, but I guess in the shape of evolution, they've decided that reproducing is way better than fighting infections. So, and you know, really who can, who can blame them? I think we're seeing the same thing in college campuses worldwide right now. <laughs> exactly. So speaking of um, combining with your mate, I believe there are other species that also may, um, leave bits of themselves inside, like maybe slugs, sea slugs? I could take the octopus, because um, I think oh, Tina perfect. takes the sea slugs, and I don't want to take her sea slugs away, because oh. I mean, there are slugs that do this as well. But there is the um, paper nautilus, which is not actually a nautilus, but an octopus. Um, Jules Verne mentioned this one in um, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Actually, he's got quite a description of these. They're unusual because they go to the surface of the ocean instead of, you know, hovering more in the depths like most octopi we think of doing. And one of the things about them is they're highly sexually dimorphic. So the female is pretty large, like much, much larger than the male and being an octopus would eat him, you know, make a snack of him probably, you know, just because he's there. So um, this is not uncommon among octopi, but this particular one, you know, they have the eight arms that give them their names and, um, and then one of these arms is a hectopodilus. And um, this little guy comes up behind the female and kind of like pokes the thing in. It acts as a penis um, that's going to transfer sort of spermatophores to that's a you know little sperm lollipops or packets to the female. And he kind of comes up to her and goes clink and lets go of the arm and then takes off, right? So that she doesn't eat him, but he does leave behind the important stuff. And the thing is, is that for a while back in, you know, I don't know how far back, they would find these females and they'd be full of these little squirmy arm things and they would think that they were parasites. <laughs> they didn't realize that they were the arms of the males. So the, so the arm still sticks to the, to the female? Yeah, the arm has gone off the male and is inside the female. They put them inside of the mantle, which is where uh, most of these things end up and these kinds of cephalopods. And so it just is in there, sperm around. Um, I don't know, you know, I haven't read how she sort of offloads it. She uses the, the paper part of what she creates um, as kind of a ballast that sort of to go up and down, which is what Jules Verne describes in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, this whole fleet of them just goes whoop and disappears all of a sudden. 
Um, so, but I don't know how she actually jettisons the arm that's <laughs> left, the arm slash, you know, intermittent organ that, you know, is left behind there. So what about the male? Does he grow it back? Yeah. Um, I did, did, I don't actually know the fate of the male's arm in this species or those species actually. So. Yeah, just because the sea slugs, um, there are some sea Good slugs yes, go that ahead. have <laughs> detachable peni, yeah. uh, penises. I don't know, Emily, what is the is proper peni? <laughs> <laughs> proper plural? Um, so they have detachable penises um, that when they mate, they just, you know, leave it behind. Mm. And, and that seems like you know, you'd be one and done, but it's okay. They've got backups. It just, you know, just give them a couple of hours, all right? And then they're ready to go again. <laughs> now I'm picturing one of those clickable pencils where you pull off the yeah, it's uh, exactly pencil like thing. That. And... It's, it's, it's like a mechanical pencil. They kind of oh. ratchet the yeah. new one out. <laughs> and they have at least three break points, right? So that they can sort of like pop out the new one. There are um, spiders that purposely break off as well. There's one um, called the Tadar, it's a, the genus is Tadaran, and it actually, so spiders typically don't have penises and they use these um, organs, they have these pedipalps in the front and they have little like boxing club ends, which is what they insert and that transmits sperm. And the spiders have two entries for insertion, so they can be half virgin, you know, or doubly intermitted and all this other stuff. Spiders are very complicated sex lives. Anyway, this particular one actually gets his, um, one of his PayPal's and wraps silk around it, torques it to the point that he breaks it off, this is purposeful, and dispenses with that thing and then he runs into the female and gets that other one in there and kind of positions himself and then when that's all done, he then becomes also a snack as well. And sometimes she will be still snacking on him while the, uh, another male will come up and, you know, like, I guess, doubly mate <laughs> on the other side of her so that, you know, all of that's accomplished. But, and the idea, they don't really know why, but they have discerned that these spiders, once they snap off that one pity belt, they run faster. And you would think, well, that would be to run away, but it's actually to catch her, I think, is what they think. That's the inference from that. Ouch. It sounds painful. So does she keep snacking on subsequent males or does she just snack on the first one and then the uh, others can? Yeah, so those are kind of nuptial gifts in a way, you know, like the praying mantises do. It's the <laughs> ultimate nuptial gift just to give your whole body to your sex partner <laughs> for a snack. <laughs> and she'll, you know, I think she probably will turn around and, you know, when she's done with the one, continue with the other, she still feels like she's not quite sated or however spiders register these things. So how about terrestrial slugs? I know we've talked, a bunch of us have opinions on terrestrial slugs and they're fascinating, um, both mating rituals and um, methods of depositing sperm. Take away, you wanna do banana slugs? I'd love to hear what you have to say. Yeah. So what? banana slug mating is absolutely fascinating. First of all, they descend, it's hard with a the background, they descend from a tree branch. So they're both hanging by a string of mucus. And they basically kind of twist around and do a thing called penis fencing to determine who is the receptive mating partner and who's the depositing mating partner. So they'll actually both of, since banana slugs are hermaphrodites, they have both the sexual organs. Um, they just, they fight with their penises in order to figure out who breaks one off and leaves it in the other partner. And that determines who um, bears the young. I like our um, our penis puppetry that we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> and then, so I need, I, I need some well, banana slug puppets. That <laughs> how, do they oh my God. how do they determine who wins, though? Is it they like, actually is don't. It like a they, thumb they, war kind they of They can both deposit. They can both inseminate oh. by poking into the other one. Usually one does and then breaks off, but they, they can both inseminate each other. So it so, could be a win-win. Yeah, it could be a win or a lose-lose, depending on how you're viewing that. Yeah. So, which way? <laughs> so another terrestrial slug is the leopard slug, right? Yeah. Linus Maximus, um, which does something very similar. They're kind of well known, like in the, at least in the 19th century, for being in outhouses, which yikes. Like you go, they're the big one of the biggest slugs, right?
way. You know, there's a leopard slug just hanging from the ceiling because one of the things they do is just like you described, they create, they climb up high and they create this mucus ring and they dangle from it. But what they do with their penises is the most, I think it's actually one, and I've watched a lot of animal sex videos now, and this has got to be one of the weirdest, most mesmerizing ones. So please go Google, you know, leopard slug sex when you get a chance. Um, they also are hermaphroditic. And so the two of them will like lower themselves on this mucus string and then ex like evert these penises that are about as long as they are, but they're kind of, they glow with like a glacial blue glow. And then they come out and this is very choreographed. They make these, these shapes. It's almost like watching clouds shape <laughs> except with two penises. And they, it's like watching a separate pair of animals hanging from this mucus plug while they, mucus plug, that's a pregnancy thing, sorry, mucus string. While they do this, you know, they make frills and they make little cones and do all these things with them. And then when they're done, they've inseminated one another, right? Because they're mapping, one of them just kind of lets the other one go, and just drops the crown, just kind of bounces and that's it. <laughs> So, so they've got they've got like glowing blue Dr. Manhattan style penis. I, I can't say that they actually glow. They just seem to glow. They have kind of an inner beauty. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't expect to find in a slug penis. So I really strongly recommend the video. <laughs> oh, I know what I'm does, looking up after this. <laughs> does the shape shifting determine like which one is is gonna? be the depositor or no, both I think they both end up depositing and it's just this choreographing and I don't know if it's just like a thing where it's like a species recognition yes you've got the right slug we're not wasting your time here on this mucus thread or what but it's really cool it's a series of sort of eight stages that they go through this like penis <laughs> mushrooms and twirls and two twos and all these things it's very really interesting it seems <laughs> like they recommend. should get a tinder or something like yeah. that and have you know yeah, I could create one at this point, honestly. I know <laughs> that. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, we've talked a lot about um, the male genitalia. How about female cave crickets, Tina? Would you talk a little bit about their so, use of genitalia? Yeah. So there are these uh, um, cave insects in Brazil that. Uh, you know, this goes under the heading of get it girl because the females have the, uh, the penis in this situation. It's, it's um, that's not the technical name for it, but that's essentially what it does. And it has multiple little barbs and things like that. And the male has sort of a, a vagina as a, it's sort of a cavity in its body where it has sperm and little pockets in there. And so the, the female goes in with her penis and 40 to 70 hours of mating. I mean, sting has nothing on these insects. Okay, this is marathon mating for sure. But over that time, those little uh, barbs and and, um, and spikes that she has on her penis will go into the little pouches and retrieve the sperm from the male and inseminate herself. So this is like total female empowerment. I am all about the Brazilian cave insects. <laughs> Yes. And I mean, it seems like, you know, I don't know why more animals don't go that way where the, where the female is like taking the action and like, Emily, I wanted to ask you about seahorses. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like I've always heard about seahorses where the male incubates the eggs and everything, but I'm like, how does he, how does he get the eggs in there? Sure. Like, you know, is the female like, you know, doing something? Is she taking some some proactive yeah. action to be like, you want to know what it's like to have babies? You have the babies. Sure. 
So actually, um, the, the the question about females who that that intermit, which is the insertion of you know one set of genital, genitals into another, um, there are all more that do that, some mites and some other stuff, as I have written about in my book. But when it comes to seahorses, although this is not technically internal fertilization for reasons I will not get into because these people get just the semantics on this is bananas. Um, the female actually has an ovipositor. She has an extension that she uses like a little like egg super slide and she inserts it into the male's pouch um, and transmits those. And there's this little tiny window of opportunity for this. So she's, that the control thing is real. When the female can do the insertion, there's no other competition on either side there, right? Cause she's right there, she pops them in, they're fertilized instantly, right? In the seahorse. So. Everybody knows who the father is <laughs> in that situation. It's not like a big surprise. And yeah, they do. Then he broods them in the pouch. So she has, it's, it's called an, it's kind of, it's like an ovipositor. So can, right in there. can he have babies with multiple females? No, this is it. That's it. She comes up, she does, she puts the eggs in, the sperm come, and then he is brooding after that. As far as I know, I always hesitate to just be like, really just like 100% no, that's all because it's biology and there are always exceptions, <laughs> you know, the so, only rule in biology. So in this case, they'd have to do a maternity test. If they yeah, were. yeah, they'd have to go, you know, sample her and make sure that she hadn't been, you know, like, I guess, depositing eggs in other pouches. I don't know. No, this is really... <laughs> <laughs> this actually reduces, you know, like sperm competition is a thing, right? If a female mates with more than one male, then you set up a stage for a competition. But if it's just one to one, there's no competition there. So, yeah. Let's move on to mating rituals. And I don't remember, I don't, didn't write down who wanted to talk about cetaceans. There is so much to talk about with cetaceans and mating. <laughs> yeah. Um, Tina, do you have any cetacean lore? Or I, I can. I really don't. Okay. Um, but I did want to talk a little bit about uh, more about the competition. Let's do that then. Yeah. So, and, and again, this is a little bit about female empowerment because uh, ducks, for instance, ducks have kind of a intense and, um, you know, triggering uh, mating system where the Males have these penises that are encased in a sack in their body. It's inside out. When they go to mate, it just kind of bursts out. It's it's a it's a um, ballistic penis. I've heard it called. Um, and it's explosive cork aversion. <laughs> yeah, it's it's corkscrew cork shaped. I can say those words uh, <laughs> and um, multiple males will try to mate with a female at the same time and the female to counteract that she's not always very receptive to all of the males that want to mate with her but uh, you know she's in She's in a group situation. It's kind of hard to just be like, nah, you stand over there, guy. So instead, what she does, she has a rather labyrinthine vagina. So there's multiple passages, and some of them are dead ends. And she can shunt the sperm from the drake that she does not want to mate with into one of those dead ends and allow the other male's sperm to get through. So, you know, so that's like a, that's a whole different level of, of competition because although the males are competing to see whose sperm gets in, it's really the female that makes that decision. So, you know, the, all power to the female ducks because, you know, they've really turned this male competition thing on its head. Female bats will do a similar kind of mate uh, mate choosing within their bodies. It's not the same as a labyrinthine, but they'll actually keep the sperm packets from mul multiple partners and just keep them until they're ready to to be pregnant and bear young when there's good resources, when the weather's right. Um, and they'll 
eject the ones they didn't want. So there's there's some mate choosing on the female side within their body as well. And that is in um, microcoroptera, not the fruit bats, but the little insectivorous bats. Mm -hmm. So yeah. is there is there not like an expiration date on these sperm? Um, I don't think that's well known. The last time I looked, I could not find an answer um, for an end date. Um, there have been females who have gone into um, diapause for like five years. Um, we had female bats and that were not in the mixed uh, sex bat colony that occasionally were like, oh yeah, gonna gonna make bat babies now. Now that wasn't within five years, that was within a year. So, um, but yeah, I couldn't find a good answer as to the end date of that. Um, Microcoroptera reproduction it hasn't, there's some questions still, some really neat questions. Did we have any other, ex oh, we had genitalia that can sense light. <laughs> I forgot about that yeah, one. <laughs> so this is, um, there's this insect that, um, they're, they're moss, I think is the, the sort of broad category. And, you know, I think you can imagine if you're a moth, it's kind of hard to know where you're putting something, right, when the time comes. And so the, apparently they have light detectors. They have receptors for light on their genitalia, the males and the females. And the males, I, it, it looks like the function of those is that it guides them to the right place somehow on the female. Oh. And for her, it guides her over, over position. So she puts them in the right place. And so Eberhard had reported on this in 1985 with enormous skepticism. You could tell he was like really into it because he's an entomologist, but also he was like, but I don't know, but it's been confirmed now, like some very, you know, studies in the Audis that really do confirm and sort of give some functional reasons why. Now I'm imagining them as those guys at the airport. With, yeah, this uh, guy, it's over here. <laughs> yeah, that way, that way, that way. No, no, wrong. <laughs> I just imagine if we had those light receptors on our genitalia, we could see with our vulva. Like, like. I know. <laughs> and then there would be no excuse whatsoever yeah. for finding <laughs> you know where the, the damn spot is. You found it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, I guess we now now we can move on to whales. <laughs> Um, whales are interesting for a lot of reasons. One of the things, this is the kinky sex one, so I will say that they do engage in trios and it looks like sort of one male is there to sort of support the other. Um, the female, there's not forced copulation like you described with uh, with some ducks necessarily. It's like that, obviously, but there are some, you know, one guy's a wingman basically to sort of, if they're in the water, they're big as semis, right? And so you can imagine it might just need to be like some positioning assistance. So, there's some of that going on, two males, one female. She will roll over. This just sound vaguely familiar. She's not interested. She will just remove her, you know, the accessible part and she'd be like, no. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but they also, whales, as you know, have still reta retained this look like very, very, this remnant hip bones, right? And for a long time, everybody's like, why the hell do they still have these? They're clearly nerve on hips. And the thing is, is that they may act like little kite maneuverers for the penis, like they're attached muscles that, that move the penis around. And so they can make the penis go flip this way, flip that way, and go up and down like this. And so, if, you know, she's rolled this way and he's rolled this way, he can go flip with his little hip muscle bone attachment and flip it into the right place. So penis puppetry? It's basically a little bit. It's like a little marionette, you know, <laughs> what's left down there. Yeah. <laughs> Also, they look like wimples, so it's real strange. Yeah, you know? <laughs> they look like floppy wimples. <laughs> so, so speaking, this is, oh. this is a stupid question, maybe, but where do the the whale genitalia exist? Like, I've never seen a whale's genitals. I guess. <laughs> okay. um, well, when they're dead, they come out. You can see them on. There's a very famous picture, actually. Um, I think it's from Holland of a beach yeah. whale with his penis hanging out. And if you really want to see them in person, minus the actual whale, there's the Phallological Museum in Iceland in Reykjavik that you can go to, which I mean, a lot of the collection, is, because it's Iceland, <laughs> a lot of the collection is well, whale phalli. And there's some great videos on YouTube of um, explosive aversion in whales because yeah. these things will shoot out yeah. real quick. And it's, um, it's a lot. <laughs> 
So wait, is it is this like a giant jar of formaldehyde with a whale penis in it? Yes, yes, it is. And the museum, and actually, fair warning, um, uh, Apple, you know how Apple will label your photos and like, oh, it looks like you took it. They'll label these as drinks. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, they're not drinks. <laughs> Just saying. Anyway, yeah. Speaking of ocean threesomes, I wanted to talk about cuttlefish. So cuttlefish have two sexual rules, which is male, female, but they also have mimic males. Um, mimic males will present, um, because cuttlefish can change their colors, can change what they look like um, very discreetly in various sections of their skin, they will look like females to another male cuttlefish while looking like a male on the other side to the female. And they'll sneak in between the male cuttlefish and the female cuttlefish, mate with the female cuttlefish and sneak off like, nope, I'm a sneaky male. It's cool. It's fine. <laughs> So he's blocking the other guy, basically? Well, not usually without... blocking. Normally, the female will mate with both, with both and multiple. They're not particularly pair bonded in any way. It's more to reduce the conflict. So the, mm -hmm. so it's the, it's the males that have less likely chance of um, reproducing um, in their normal way. They, they do it that way. So they'll sneak in and reproduce. Which so, I love the idea of them camouflaging one side of their body and camouflaging the other side the other way. Yeah. It's like yeah. Two-Face of the animal world. <laughs> the Janus face cuttlefish. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> so so the 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 actual well the actual they're both actually males, right? But the, yeah, they're both actually males. Uh they they are both males. So the but the the male who is just male and is not camouflaging himself, he's he's mating with the female. Yeah, but he's mating also, with the female, but, but also, also ignoring the other female. Yeah, but he's he's cool with the other one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's it's a <laughs> conflict reduction thing in cuttlefish. So there's there's a thing I don't know about that Emily Willingham mentioned in our talk, which was an animal basically mating itself to death. Yeah, so I am not familiar with this animal. Okay, this is an it's a marsupial, uh, you know, obviously an Australian marsupial. It's Antipinus. Um, it you know it's a kind of rodent. Those are, those are also called quolls, right? Well, they're related. They're quolls that are related to this animal. Yeah, and okay. the quolls themselves are a little funny because they've got. I'm going to digress just a little bit here. They have. You know, they have penises, but their penises have this little attachment on it, and that attachment doesn't actually insert into the female full vagina. It's actually an anal attachment, and so it's a double insertion, vaginal and oh. anal, that the vaginal one is goes and, you know, gets into the right way. <laughs> I just did that. <laughs> like, I just do this all my life. I don't know what I'm doing. Anyway, it actually, the anal one helps them place the vaginal one in the right location. I don't know why foals would be confused about that, but anyway. And so, Maybe they need those landing lights. I yeah, so, yeah. If only they could see with those. Um, but the and so antipinus is um, interesting because what you just described, Emily, is actually probably familiar to a lot of people. It's something salmon do, right? I mean, they go, they live their lives, and then they go to this enormous struggle once it's just time to mate. And they, well, you know, the bears and fishermen and all this other stuff, just for the sake to get a chance to go spawn, right? And that's called semel parody. And antipinus does that, but it's unusual because it's a mammal doing it. And there's this signal that, um, that there's a season coming, it's a mating season. The females start to do stuff where they sort of gather and they nest and all those other things. And the males are just like, this is wig out. And the weird thing is, is the trigger for this is just an increase in or a decrease. And the number, it's a change in the number of seconds of daylight. And it's just like this really tiny, tiny change to me as a human, but I guess to this thing, it's a big deal. And they suddenly start going around trying to shag every single female they can find. And they do it to the detriment of everything else. And so after you know, ending their lives doing this, they don't eat, they don't do anything else except try to mate with females. And their you know, bodies falling apart, skin's falling off. They have no food in their stomachs. They're just it's falling, just disintegrating as they go. And then they die. And... <laughs> 
you know, I mean, that's just what they do. And so they've mapped this and there's an increase in cortisol, which is a stress hormone as this process is going on. And it's not funny, but they do have a graph where they map this cortisol increase with for the females and the males. And there's just, the, you know, the females graph just keeps going kind of plateau, you know, hits asymptote and plateaus and the male just stops and just says male's dead. <laughs> that's it. That's it. <laughs> it for anti-communists, it's over. <laughs> and they travel while they're doing yeah. this like they are like on the hunt for the females and yeah. they travel like long. huge distances huh. yeah yep it is it's like salmon i mean it's a you know it's similar parody except it's in a mammal and so that's of course sort of you know we, we view that as unusual but if you had described salmon that way everybody would have been like oh yeah <laughs> that's what they do yeah right yeah salmon cicadas yeah yeah it's very yeah. common in the bug world but, but mammals seriously marsupials it. yeah at the end, you know, like this guy is looking like a wreck. You know, yeah, he's not attractive, I don't think, to a female at this point. Yeah, right? How many females want to mate with him at that point? Like, seems not like me. really well, counterproductive. See, did we have other mating rituals we wanted to talk about, either of you? I feel like I might have missed some of your comments on this section. Oh, you, you were going to do pandas, Emily. I want to hear yeah. That. Talk about hey. pandas. Okay. So pandas, pandas, pandas have a reputation for being terrible at sex, just terrible at it. They, they, they're not good at it. They, it, but they're, they're actually not that bad in the wild. It's just our world is very maladapted for pandas because they have um, one mating time a year. They have large, um, they have large habitats and of course they're losing their habitat. So where the problem with panda, um, sorry, panda reproduction comes in is in captivity where humans are trying to mate pandas. And pandas are absolutely not good at sex in captivity. They don't wanna do it. The males don't know how to do it. Um, female pandas are only receptive from about 24 hours to 72 hours in estrus, so they can only get pregnant in that 72 hour period. And the males historically in captivity couldn't figure out what to do with them. So the females would be like, hey, hey, ready? Ready, get, no, no, okay, fine. I guess I'll wait until next year, which of course is, makes it a challenge um, when you're trying to increase a species and get genetic diversity because you don't want to wait another year for your pengu for penguins, for your pandas <laughs> to reproduce. So some zoos have taken some very interesting measures in order to encourage their pandas. They have created panda porn that they show their juvenile males to kind of show them what other pandas do because the pandas in captivity, of course, are pandas in captivity that are the children of pandas in captivity. They've been raised by humans. They have had not as extensive um, introduction to wild panda behaviors. So they actually either show these pandas porn or they will actually encourage panda voyeurism where they put a young male near the enclosure so the young male can observe the other pandas mating. Um, and pand I learned today what panda sex sounds like because in Hong Kong um, this January, they observed successful panda mating between their pair um, for the first time in a very long time. And they think it's because it was because of coronavirus has decreased the attendance and the distractions at the zoo. So they think the pandas were like, oh, finally, we get some privacy. We've been waiting for this. Um, and there were zookeepers. <laughs> yeah. There were zookeepers standing by with videos and the sound video cameras and the sounds that pandas make is this haunting cackling like marionette <laughs> noise of <laughs> and i will be hearing it in my in my dreams for weeks i highly recommend looking up this video of now pandas. is that is that both of them or yeah they're they were both making it though the funny thing about the video is that at one point the female panda looks down like are we, is this happening? Like <laughs> the male is going at it and she just looks like, oh, what, what well, is that? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not sure you're doing this right, but sure. 
<laughs> it is it is so funny. I might have scared my cats laughing at this panda and her look. Um, <laughs> the whole thing with pandas with the, the pseudo pregnancy is really yeah. strange too. Yeah, so pandas, um, it's really hard to tell when a panda is pregnant. It's really hard for a panda to keep a pregnancy. And part of that artificial insemination does not generally lead to successful panda pregnancies. Um, that's why they're working so hard to get them to mate because there's a much higher a much higher rate of success with um, a natural mating event leading to a pregnancy. Um, pandas will pretend, they're basically the female's body pretends she's pregnant and isn't. Um, so, and that is a pseudo pregnancy or the zookeepers try to um, do scans and find out if the female is pregnant. And it turns out, no, it was just a particularly large poop. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, we thought that was a particularly large poop, but that's actually a panda baby. So, yeah, well, pandas in, have it hard. In this panda porn, uh -huh. are there certain panda porn stars? Like, are there some males who are, like, super good at it? And, like, I, I could an example for everybody else? I, I really hope there is. Like, I hope there's one panda who is just the panda porn star, but I, I couldn't actually get the names of any of the pandas in the panda porn well, please tell me his name is ron jeremy ron <laughs> panda. <laughs> the idea of panda awesome. porn just well i have i just want to tell people about it whenever i read about it like that's, look that's at this exciting good. thing it's so a, it's it's young a service emily it's yeah that you do that is, and are the young males like actually into watching it? Yeah. Or um, are they like a little embarrassed because their keepers are like. I think they probably down, leave, they leave them alone. They pretend the, that the door with locks. With the, the sex ed version yeah. of it. Like, yeah. like you see in school and you're just like so cringing. Yeah. The interesting thing is it has been shown to work. Um, I do not remember which zoo. It was one of, I, I want to say a zoo that's actually in China. Um, China owns all of the pandas. So all pandas, all breeding pandas are on loan from China. But I think these pandas actually were in China. They, they showed them videos to the young males. Um, they let the males be voyeurs and observe. And they did have more successful mating encounters and more pa panda pregnancies than they had before. So it seems to be working. Cool. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, turkeys need a lot of help in, yeah. in mating too, because they basically, they just physically can't do it yeah. anymore. Um, so, you know, they, uh, they have to have artificial insemination, but I don't know if they like even bother to try anymore. Yeah, I don't know. That must be farm turkeys because our wild turkeys are. Yeah, that's problems. farm. Turkeys. <laughs> yeah, the it's the farm yeah. turkeys because the problem yeah. is that we've we've um, bred turkeys to have such big breasts. Yeah. That yeah. they can't they can't that's physically different. do the manipulations yeah. to get the parts where they need to be. Right. Yeah. Now I'm gonna have to look up farm turkey reproduction. Yeah. You <laughs> My, there. My search history is going to be great. It always is. <laughs> Are we going to do mouth parts next? Yeah, let's move to mouth parts. So many mouth parts. Yeah, let's let's talk about ticks. <laughs> I just mentioned them in passing because there's actually there's a list. Insects are really into like putting. Yeah things into their mouths while they're in the process of copulation. And so there are these male ticks that move their mouth parts around in the female genitalia before they get things going. And that's just how it's described. <laughs> it's just, they move their mouth parts around in there. Um, there are these um, harvestmen, which is, um, it's a kind of arachnid that has an intro, has an intermittent organ, has a penis, but it will actually sometimes put that in the female's mouth parts before it inserts it into her, her genital tract. Um, 
daddy long legs is another it's a spider species that often gets conflated with harvestmen but anyway this one's an actual spider will take its eye stalks and poke them into her mouth while wait eye yeah. stalks yeah into the mouth and oh also they some of these species with eye stalks they go head to head with eye stalks to see who has the wider eye stalk spread <laughs> <laughs> that's like kind of like a male male competition thing um not necessarily that species but anyway it's an eye stalk thing that they'll do <laughs> this is my new favorite thing <laughs> yeah. and this this spider puts the eye stalks in the female's mouth there's a co-evolution there's a call and response going on there and so it's subject to sexual selection and her mouth shapes his eye stalks huh. um yeah and then so the best does, one does she, i'm sorry does she eat the eye stalk or yeah, she, she, she is just them. there yeah, it's just like here's a little eye stock titillation for you, baby. I don't know why they're doing <laughs> you know. You know what? People um, are into all sorts of things. Why not spiders as well? Why not spiders as well? And then this is actually my favorite one because there is of course a video. Um if you look it up, it's called These Worms Suck. Just you know, Google that and you'll find it. But it's marine flatworms. Um they will after they have, you know, they they're little bitty. They're like one and a half millimeters long. And at least in a lab anyway, they do the stuff that flatworms do where they reel around and they make yin and yang formations and all this other stuff. And when they're done, <laughs> there's this kind of like schmutz left in their opening where the spermatophores were deposited, right? And it's just like, it's got stuff hanging out of them. And so the animal who's got the stuff hanging out of it will just reach around with its head and just suck it out of their anal, <laughs> basically their rear end, you know? <laughs> and so that's why these worms suck and essentially because this is kind of one of those animals where you kind of just poke in sperm anywhere honestly and it'll get where it needs to go and so they're just getting it in through their mouths because they couldn't fit it all on the other end and just taking up more sperm just kind of taking up oh. as much as they can so if you google these worms suck <laughs> you'll find video it's so wow. much wow <laughs> yeah, I'm to show it to the pandas. That's, if you, that's an every sperm is sacred kind yeah. of situation I guess it really is yes very much so bats will do a similar thing. Um, well, not with injecting sperm everywhere. No, bats don't work that way. Um, fruit bats this time, Macrochiroptera, the big guys. Um, they, they actually will do oral sex, both for males and females. So, and it's part of the longer the oral sex is, the longer the actual copulation is. So the longer the male bat goes down on the female bat, the longer they get to uh, mate with the female bat. The longer mm -hmm. the female bat licks the male bat while they're mating, because bats are extremely, extremely flexible, um, the longer mm -hmm. it stays in um, and the longer the, the longer the copulation lasts. That and seems I think, totally fair. But yeah. I do have a question about bat mating. Like, where do they do it? Are they doing it while they're hanging upside down? Do they like get down on the ground? What? I actually fly? don't know. I've, <laughs> I've witnessed um, insectivorous bats mating on the ground, but that was a captive colony. Um, so they were not really normal bats at all. Um, like behavior wise, they, they actually, they had some behaviors that were not typical of bats. So I don't know if bats in general will mate on the ground. Um, I would guess mostly they probably mate in the same roosting spots that they have, since those are um, out of the way of predators. And they're very, since their their toes will grasp without any movement, it's not like they need to put any effort into muscle mass into hanging upside down. So I really hope they do upside down mating, but I don't know for sure. Do we want to talk about bonobos? Do we? Well, the interesting thing about bonobos is their oral sex is not necessarily a sexual act. It's an act of um, community building. So they, they will perform oral sex on other animals in their community. And it does not matter what sex they are. The females will perform oral sex on females and will masturbate females. Males will perform it on males. Um, and it's more of a social bonding act where they, they actually will encourage their own specific um, relationships to make them stronger, um, make them more 
Did you have stuff about bonobos as well? I had some, but I cut it because I didn't have room for orgasm. <laughs> no, well, we can, sense, but <laughs> we can talk have, about orgasms. <laughs> yeah, so I just, I find them really interesting because, you know, the females will scissor, right? And they, mm-hmm. their the orgasm is part of it, but it's this useful orgasm that is for social bonding. And everybody, you know how people talk about the female human orgasm. My God, why is that there? And there's just all of this discussion around it. And Oh, can't think anyway. Um, it's interesting, so I don't mean to d- dismiss it, but when you look at bonobos and what they're doing, I mean, it's not exactly the same thing as sitting next to one of your really close friends on the couch and watching a movie, but I imagine kind of maybe physiologically, like the outcomes with oxytocin and other social bonding, you know, physiology is similar. Um, so, and I feel like maybe if we are generally you know we tend to form pair bonds that last for some period of time that that probably helps to you know seal up the pair bonds for us Mm -hmm. and you know you get kind of more relaxed with it and and engage in it more and more with one person everybody gets better at it you hope if not so please leave (laughs) figure it out work it out yeah so I just find Mano is really interesting for that reason because there's just these hints that it has that utility for social bonding. So they're so interesting, I think. Yeah, Bonobo. yeah we could do an entire panel I on Bonobos. <laughs> So our last section, we have a couple more minutes left. Um, social distancing reproduction. <laughs> so would anyone like to talk about any um reproduction without direct contact? Well, you know, plants are champions of this. And anyone who suffers from hay fever or ragweed allergies or whatever, uh, you're basically allergic to sperm because pollen (laughs) are these um, microgametes that male plants release or that are released from the male organ. Some some plants do have sort of a, a male and female of the species, whereas others have both parts. Um, but yeah, so pollen gets broadcast everywhere. So, you know, when oak trees are like pollinating and your car is covered in that yellow stuff, that's sperm my friend so think about that next time (laughs) i love the idea that some plants basically have interspecies threesomes with animals so you've got you've got the 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 wingman (laughs) yeah you've got you've got the bee like here gonna let's let's get you over here to meet with you i'm gonna pick up some pollen and we'll pollinate over there yeah. yeah, and like some plants are real particular too yep. about which uh, pollinators they will allow. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, like tomatoes, like they like a little vibrator action because they get it with the, the bumblebees and stuff. The bumblebee comes in and the little buzz. I really there. wish my tomatoes would have a little less vibrator action because they're they're some pretty prolific this year. Like maybe we could move <laughs> over the zucchini or the squash. Like let's let's give them some more action. <laughs> <laughs> My tomatoes are fine. <laughs> so what's one thing that amuses me is the animal with the biggest um, penis to body ratio, the barnacle, where the body is like that big. The penis is basically my arm. Mm-hmm. They still engage in um, what's called sperm casting. So the barnacle, the barnacle has developed this very long penis because of course they're attached to rocks and they can't move to find their partners. So instead they, they do that and go find their partners. Um, but when they're too far away, they will just cast their sperm into the wilds. They'll sow their wild oats that'll be taken <laughs> there to by the currents to, um, to the, 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 to oh, fertilize right. the female. <laughs> All part of the barnacle. Yep. Yeah. There's a um a springtail. I don't know. Babe. This is one. This is a video. You can go find this video. Springtail. Um, which is not an insect, but it is very. It would put you in mind of one. It's an arthropod, and the female is quite large, and the male is not as big as she is. And he's. <laughs> they use spermatophores, and so they plant these little sperm lollipops on the ground. And the hope is that the female will walk across it and pick it up right into her genital tract. But the thing is, is that 
and that would be distant, right? But in this case, there's this competition because the female might also just eat it and not for fertilization, but just because it's like a tasty snack. And so they do this thing where they approach each other and the little male and the female, and they rear up and they do this little dance and they dance around and he's trying to angle her and she's angling him. And then I, he, for some reason, he decides the time is right and they turn and they get face to face and he tr puts a little antenna and tries to like prop her face a little bit, just like kind of hold it in place. And then he goes and he plops down his little spermatophore and this is the moment of truth he tries to keep her at a distance with his antenna so she doesn't eat it before he can get her angled around so that she's on top of it yeah, you, you almost <laughs> have that with some retail because he's like hold on just gotta turn just so you know anyway so it's kind of funny they're not the only arthropods that do this little kind of dance there's a pseudo scorpion that does that too plops down oh. the lollipop gets a little dance female kind of like you know, sambas are backwards, you know, it's just like Doof! over the spermatophore. They also eat each other's spermatophores. It's like a bit of sperm competition outside of the female, right? They just go around and go, oh, that's not mine, and they eat it. Huh. <laughs> so. Who left that here? I'll have one of those. Multiple <laughs> spermatophores. I'll have what she's having. Exactly. <laughs> The last one I had for social distancing were um, a species of velvet worm that actually will catapult their sperm packets to the other velvet worm. Like, mm -hmm. so, pew, and try to get it to land on them. And then the sperm packet will absorb into the, fl into the, the body and fertilize that way. So, um, yeah, mating via trebuchet. There you go. Wow, that's... That's medieval. Yeah. <laughs> I guess so I, it's a, it's it's way earlier than medieval though, right? That's you know, it's amazing that how these things evolved and that they are still around. Because yeah. a lot of it seems like very inefficient, but I guess it works well enough. Yeah. I mean, look at humans. We have to we had to create an entire internet infrastructure to make apps so that we could go like, oh, I don't want to mate with that. Oh. <laughs> well, we are about out of time. So Emily and Tino, would you like to tell everyone where people can find you on the internet and if you have any fun, exciting projects to talk about? Uh, yes, so you can find me at sciencenews.org. Um, I'm mostly writing about coronavirus stuff these days. So uh, if, you, if you have questions about coronavirus, um, you know, come to sciencenews.org. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at THSAY. So last name is S-A-E-Y. Um, yeah, so you can find me on Twitter. I write for a lot of different outlets. Um, my Twitter handle is EJ Willingham. And I do have a book coming out that is somewhat appropriate for our discussion today. It's called Fallacy, P-H-A-L-L-A-C-Y, Life Lessons from the Animal Penis. And there are, are definitely some lessons we still have to learn even after this great session. Thank you for having me here. Well, I cannot wait to read that book. Um, I'm Emily Fink. You can find me at Celix on Twitter, S-E-E-L-I-X. Um, and I want to thank both of our panelists for being here. This was a great panel and um, enjoy the rest of Dragon Con, everyone. Dragon Thank Con you. goes virtual, everyone. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Fun. <laughs> <laughs>